I am so pleased to be standing here now because as a child growing up, I had no voice. Terrible things were happening to me and I had no way of telling anybody what was happening. I felt forced to keep the secret. I'm standing here now because I am choosing not to keep the secret. So what was the secret? Between the ages of three and seven, I lived in an extremely violent home. And my mother thought she would try to keep me away from the violence and she would leave me with my grandparents, not knowing that my grandfather was a paedophile. So not only did I live with violence, I was also living with sexual abuse and the trauma of it left me unable to read until I was nearly eight years old because children who aren't safe find it really difficult to learn. I kept wondering, why does no adult make this stop? And then one day, my grandmother actually looked through the window when he was forcing me to do things to him. And there was just this moment of hope. And I thought, wow, it's going to stop. She's going to make it stop. But she didn't make it stop. She went mad and she screamed at me and told me that I was a wicked child and I made it happen. And if I told anybody that I would be taken into care and taken away from my mother. And so I kept the secret. The first 20 years of my career were absolutely amazing. Um, I became a crime reporter and a presenter, and I worked at ITV, first of all, and you can see my many hairdos. Uh, <laughs> I went on to work at the BBC and at Sky. And I had an amazing job. It's the best job in the world. I loved it. And I loved being a crime reporter, giving people a voice and challenging abuse of power and authority. Um, and it was a really glamorous job. I had makeup artists and drivers, and it was amazing. But I didn't feel glamorous, because underneath I felt that I somehow was really ugly, and I felt isolated, and I kept the secret. And I think I continued to keep the secret, because on some level, my grandmother had put into my subconscious that this was all my fault. And so, although I had this amazing job, I carried around this terrible secret. And then something changed my life. I had a car crash on my way to work, on my way to the BBC studios. I had a head-on car crash, and I nearly died. And actually, when I came round, after the steering wheel had hit me in the face, um, I actually didn't know if I was alive or dead. And there was this eerie moment, and my very first thought was that I was completely desolate because I wouldn't see my wonderful husband, Neil, ever again. But the most overwhelming feeling was that I, I had done nothing that would have made a difference, that actually nobody would have known that I'd been on this planet. Even though I'd had the most incredible job, I wasn't leaving anything behind, and I didn't have my children then. But it was, I was just so disappointed in myself. I felt like I was in a video game, like, no, I can't be dead. I haven't done anything. And so I promised myself and I promised God that if I survived, I would do something different with my skills. And I truly believe that when you change the way you think, you create new opportunities. And what I realized in this moment, I started to think about what would have made a difference to me when I was growing up. And definitely what would have made a difference would have been having somebody to talk to, but not just having somebody to talk to, but to have the words to know how to ask for help. Because do you know what? You can't walk up to your teacher and say, do you know what, miss? Every time I go and see my granddad, this is what happens to me. You, ha you don't have a way to communicate when terrible things are happening to you when um, you are a child. And so I thought, what made a difference? And the first thing that made a difference was my amazing grandmother, because my mum left my father because she knew that he was actually going to kill her. He tried to pour boiling oil on her, and that was the moment at which she realised that she would die if she stayed. So we went from absolute hell to live in this beautiful eight-bedroom house that my grandmother owned. But what was amazing is she was such an incredible, strong woman. So when my father turned up banging on the door and trying to smash the windows, she said, how dare you? I'm calling the police. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> so she called the police, and the police came. And the policeman, um, my father ran away, of course. And the policeman, I remember him sitting me on my lap, uh, on his lap. And I just remember thinking that that was the first time in my life that I'd ever felt safe. I didn't actually know what it felt like to be safe. So I thought this is a really important thing. The other role model, I was so lucky. I don't know if any of you have watched Strictly Come Dancing, but Len Goodman used to be the head judge, and his dance school he opened in Dartford just as I went to live with my grandmother. So Len Goodman became my dance teacher. And he was the most amazing, funny man. And for the first time in my life, 
There was a safe space with a trustworthy man who made me laugh and who told me that I was good at something. And I just thought role models are so important in your life and they can help you to recover from trauma. And then the other role model in my life was my beautiful auntie Elaine. And my auntie loved me so much. And that's when I realized that love doesn't have to come from your parents. Somebody needs to love you and to give you love and kindness. So these are things that I thought about. I also knew when I'd recovered from my accident that the first thing, if you want to change the world, you can't really change the world, but you can change yourself. So I knew the first thing that I had to do was to tell the secret. And again, this was the moment in which I realized that you can't change how you grew up and where you grew up and what happened to you, but you can see yourself as a creator and not the victim of your life. You can actually create your future. You can't change the past, but you can create what you want. So it was my intention to use my skills in a, in a better way. And amazingly, Sir John Stevens, who was the commissioner and who I'd known for a long time, asked me to host the Enough is Enough domestic violence conference with him. And it was so, so important. It was the first time that the police had said domestic violence is not a woman's issue. Domestic violence is a crime. And I stood alongside the commissioner, and he asked me if I would open the conference by telling my own personal story. And there I told my secret for the first time. So an amazing opportunity happened. He also asked me to start training community safety officers on the effects of violence and abuse on children. And frankly, I was a bit of a gift to the media because I could do a 30-second soundbite. I didn't mind having my face shown, and I was talking about things that the media liked to talk about about violence and obviously the things that had happened to me. So I did go on a bit of a spree across the country um, and then I realized what was the point in me publicly impaling myself all over the place if actually nothing was changing. So I, I was beginning to make a difference but I wasn't actually doing anything. And so um, we decided, my husband and I, that we would open um, a homeless hostel. Again, we were offered another opportunity. Um, and in the hostel, I saw for myself, which I wouldn't have believed, learned behavior. So I heard children being told, people like us don't get jobs. People like us don't have homes. I thought, who are people like us? We can create what we want. And so we start, I started to talk to children about what they dreamed of being, and I knew that this was possible to put dreams and aspirations. Because my grandmother, when I went to live with her, I couldn't read. And in the short space of living with her in the summer holidays, suddenly I learned to read and everything made sense. And she said to me, you know what, we were watching Thames News. She said, you read so well now, you could do that job like that man does. And I was 22 when I read the news with Andrew Gardner. And I just know that dreams and aspirations can be put into your mind. And so in our homeless hostel, I saw how quickly children could change if their thoughts were changed. So I had the idea, one of the other things that would have made a difference to me was having a friend, because I felt very different from other children. And so I decided to create a friend for children, the friend that I would have liked to have had. So I created Dotcom to be a cartoon friend to children. And I gave her um, all, uh, all of the things that I, I loved about the, the friend that I would have liked to have had. And she's a friend to children. So that was the beginning. But then when I started to um, advise the police and look at how they were communicating their messages of safety, I realized that what was absolutely fundamental was how those messages were communicated. You can talk to children about anything if you create the right mechanism and the right environment. And so I created um, some journals for children. And the journals are a journey for the children. And within the journals, we put some simple techniques to teach them how to communicate. And I believe communication, teaching children communication skills, is a fundamental skill. Because talking about your feelings is really hard. And it is something that you need to practice. And the earlier we practice it, the better we can be. And so I taught them in the journals. They can ask for a dot-com minute. A dot-com minute is when you want to talk about things that frighten or worry you. I taught them about the helping hand so that they could create their own network of people they could turn to and talk to, so they were practicing who they could turn to if they felt unsafe or worried or frightened about things. I also taught them, Dot teaches them, feelings are just feelings. There are no right or wrong feelings. However, you need to stop, feel, think and do because your behavior is a choice. So just giving them really simple techniques and then thinking about who can we tell and who can we talk to. And I am special, dot special, you are special like dot. And thinking about why you're special, that is your inoculation against grooming.
because groomers often are the first person that's told a child that they're special. So immediately they have that child in their thrall. Also, what's very important to me are Dot's uh-oh signs. So if Dot's knees are wobbly like a jelly, then uh-oh, she doesn't feel safe. And that is them learning their own fight or flight instincts. So I got to this point now where nearly a million children have been through the program, and it's amazing. But the creation continues, because I wanted to reach more and more children. And through Essex Police, they asked me if I would look at the current digital threat to children and we would create a new resource, and they would help me to get it funded. So we have now created a new digital resource. Dotcom is technology for good, and children will be able to do the digital journal. And the journal, the technology will flag up to the teacher if a child has written things that show the teacher that the child is feeling unsafe. So this technology is an amazing safeguarding gift for children and also huge fun. And everything about DOT is about children, so the children are part of the creation. So I work with these beautiful and amazing children from Holy Cross School in Essex, and they told me what needed to be in the journal. So we've been on this incredible journey of creation. And I am now a mum, um, and believe me, child abuse is a lifelong thing. It took me 10 years to have my children and to believe that I could be a mother and I would be a good mother. And I have the most beautiful children, Amelia and Joshua, seven-year-old twins, and um, they are autistic. And it's hard for them. You know, they have recently had a very hard time in, a, in their mainstream school because they don't learn like other people either. Um, but the most amazing thing is that when they come home, even with their disability, they know how to tell us what has happened and how they're feeling and how to express that. And I believe as a mother that that is the greatest gift that you can give your child. It's how you keep them safe. And it means that they do not bottle up these feelings. The last thing that I want to share with you, um, which is absolutely incredible, is that .com is going to have her own well-being channel. Thanks to the most amazing guys at Too Simple, who already are in like 11,000 schools in 72 countries, Dot's going there. <laughs> so I am so delighted. And I would like to ask all of you, anyone watching, I want you to help me to get this into every school that we can, um, as many people, but also to think about the children in your life and to, to, to think about, can you be that safe person? Can you be that person that expresses your feelings to them and shows them, mirrors what they can do and helps them? So I suppose I'd like to just leave you... Um, with the final thought, but really teaching them. I know, because I'm an older mum, that I'm going to have to leave them, but at least I know that they can ask for help and they know how to talk about their feelings. So, I presume, the next time I go to see St Peter, it will not be a rehearsal. <laughs> but he may not take me to heaven. However, I will know that I can rest in peace because I know I've made a difference. Thank you. Thank you.